So Heavenly Father, we come before you, we thank, we thank you and we praise you, Father God, that you're ever present with us, ever yes. leading us and guiding us into all truth. Lord, that you're ever changing in us and before us as you grow and grow. And as we, Lord, learn who you are and who we are in you. And we give you praise for it, Father God, because we enjoy being stretched. We enjoy the new wineskin being stretched, Lord. And we always want to be a new wineskin for the new revelations that you give us through through and by your word through the Holy Spirit. Thank you and praise you in Jesus' name for it all. Amen. Amen. So I tweak the, um, the the title a little bit because of where we're going now. So it's how and who. How? Oh no, I've changed it since then. Oh. Do you equate God today? Is it just called? We'll we'll leave it at this. How and who do you equate God with today? But I've changed it again. Okay. <laughs> as it as it as the teaching grows, the title isn't sufficient. So well, that's good. Well, as you said, it's the fifth of February, two thousand twenty-three. And I'd like to start off again this week with that quote that we used last week from Rick Joyner's book, The Journey Begins. And, it, and I quote, The whole spiritual process of our journey begins with one of increasing light and biblical understanding. All of this increasing light and understanding is but the recovery of truth that was lost by the church during the Dark Ages, and even the most cursory study of church history will reveal a systematic pattern where truth and understanding were removed from the church for a period that lasted approximately 1,200 years, end of quote. So would that be going on today? Well, it says that I, I left okay. a, a portion out that it says for the last 600 years, it's been increasing and coming back. Oh, okay. Wonderful. Now, the main problem with the allegory or the symbolic method of interpretation is that it can be so subjective in nature. It's easily diluted, distorted, and or confused by our prejudice, our doctrines, our insecurities, yeah. our rebellion, our bitterness, and so on. So, if then revelation is defined as a direct enlightenment from the Lord, then it can and should stand the test of any biblical challenge from the scriptures. And this will also help to illuminate and separate any other influences with our tendency to move towards a free association. Because God is the revelation. Yes. Yeah. So mankind, over the course of church history, has incorporated knowingly or unknowingly many false concepts, ideas, and images about God. So here's the question that's asked, framed a different way. How do you perceive me? And to what likeness Will you attach to me? Now, within this question asked by God in Isaiah 40, he, actually is, he is actually hoping that we get the picture, as we have said, or we said last time, that he is incomparable and unequaled to anything you have ever known. 
now to, to Isaiah 46. Isaiah 46. Isaiah 46. Isaiah 46. Yeah. I, I know I said Isaiah 40, but I just wanted you to move to Isaiah. Oh, I see. Oh. Yes. So Isaiah 46, verses 6 and 7. Mm -hmm. We've looked at these scriptures over the last couple of years several times. But it starts off by saying, They lavish gold out of a cup or bag, weigh out silver on the scales, and hire a goldsmith, and he fashions it into a guard. Then they fall down. Yes, they worship it. And this reminds me, body of Christ, when I was in um, India, on the uh, east coast of India, and Mangalore, Mangalore, it was in Mangalore, and we would have the daily crusade, and then we would come back to the, to the hotel. And, uh, well, I just want to use this one example. They knew that I was the crusade director, and so when everybody's eaten, they would come to clean the tables, and they would start to ask me questions. The waiters, the management, they'd come to ask me questions. And this one catering manager was quite perplexed. So he shared with me this story. Now, as you know, in India, there are many, many gods. So he had bought himself a statuette of a god. He placed it in his house on, a, on an altar. And he began to pray to it. He was desperately seeking an answer. And God spoke to him, not the English. No. God spoke to him. Of course, I have to explain this to him, that it wasn't the image that you bought made out of plastic, not plasticine, uh, clay, and that you put in your mantle and you were worshiping it because he was bowing down and worshiping it. I said, it was God talking to your heart. He came, you called, he came. And then I told him very briefly about that man in Africa at the turn of the century who was crying out and crying out. Again, they went out into the jungle, they chopped down a tree and they carved an image and they put it on the altar and they bowed down and they worshiped it. And he said, I know you're there, but I don't know who you are. I know you send the seasons to grow our food but I want to know your name. And the only reason I mentioned that is because he went into the, into the jungle, made an image, bowed down and worshipped it, just like we're seeing here in this uh, passage of Isaiah. And then verse 7 goes on to say, They bear it upon their shoulders in religious possessions or into battle. They carry it and set it down in its place, and there it stands. It cannot move from this place, even if one cries to it for help, as this man was in India, yet the idol cannot answer or save him out of his distress. No. No. Now, let's make this personal. Yes. Right? We're going to apply it to ourselves. They carry it on their shoulders, or you carry it on your shoulders, which means... You carry it around in your head, yeah. within your imagination. And this is what you think. And some within mankind place great value upon it, upon what you think in your imagination. Right. Like man's technology and his advances in the sciences, carrying it around on their shoulders or in their heads holding it within their minds, giving it great value. Do we see the parallel yeah. to Isaiah to, to, to today? Well, well, yes. With man's technology, see, it's all head knowledge. They carry it around in their heads. So in, in other words, they carry it around on their shoulders because that's where your head is. Yeah. So we can see that today, Mankind is worshipping all manner of gods. And we see from the last line in verse 7 
that it reads, yet the idol cannot answer or save him out of his distress. We can see today that the world's in great distress. And yes, man's worshipping still his idols. While the world is in distress, he's worshipping his idols. He's worshipping money. He's worshipping oil. And it renders him inept in being able to rectify the damage that has already been done because he's still worshipping his idols. He's still carrying it around on his shoulders. And for practical reasons, this is so important that we understand this within the body of Christ today because there are many people who do not seem to be able to get an answer from God. Finding themselves entrenched within their troubles, unable to obtain an answer. Now here's a very poignant question for you. Could it be that they have a false image of God? Or no, no image at all. Or no image at all, that's right. And that the God that they are crying out to cannot answer them, as we find in Isaiah 46, 7. Mm -hmm. There it stands. It's set in place, and it cannot move. So the first thing then that we would do if we were, if that were the case, and we were not getting any answers, would be to ask ourselves, what kind of God are we calling upon? To whom then have I made him equal? Or to whom then have you made him equal? To the conclusions that I've reached concerning his nature and his character. So to whom then have you made him equal? To the conclusions that you have reached concerning his nature and his character. So let's begin then to talk about the character and nature of God. So we're going to go where no man has gone before. No. But we're going to start to talk about the character and nature of God. And why do we need to do that? Why? Because we, need to know him. Because we yes, we need to know him. Because we believe that God's character and nature has been the target of the enemy for centuries. For centuries now, it's been the, it's been the, 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 uh, at the center of the enemy's attacks to sully and to darken God's character and nature yeah, yeah. within the church and within the world. Oh, every time. No. Every time they'll throw that at us. Now, I guess you can go to any university campus or college, talk to the faculty, and you'll find very few who have an open, implausible expression of the character and nature of God. You'll find that the second, you'll find that the second second, to the nature of God being under attack, I misspelled that there, is that all of humanity identify, let me see if I can make sense of what I've typed here, you'll find that regarding the nature of God being under attack is that all of humanity's identity and where man came from, these two things that we just mentioned, which two? The nature of God being under attack and humanity's identity and where men came from. These are two things that are really key in the arsenal of the devil. Because if he can get you to denigrate the character and nature of God, he'll get you to blaspheme all things about him. Why are these two things undermined? 
From this then you can say that the foundations are destroyed. If he can get those two things denigrated, then the foundations of who God is in your mind and in your heart are destroyed. Remember that this is all it took in the garden to undermine right. Adam's relationship. Yeah. Yeah. Thus destroying the foundations there of their relationship with their father. Turn with me to Genesis, the third chapter. We're going to look at verses 2 through 6. You just hear him slithering away, hissing mm -hmm. that little sentence. Mm -hmm. mm. We're going to start with verse 2. Right, start with verse 2. And the woman said to the serpent, so the serpent already, has already beguiled her. That's already on the red flag. We may eat the fruit from the trees of the garden, except the fruit from the tree, which is in the middle of the garden, God has said, you shall not eat of it, neither shall you touch it, ah, lest you die. But the serpent said to the woman, you shall not surely die, for God knows in the day that you eat it, your eyes will be opened and you will be like God, knowing the difference between good and evil and blessing and calamity. Remember, if you will, if you haven't thought about this already, remember that neither of them, neither of the Adams, the male and the female, neither of them knew about the fall of Lucifer. That's right. Verse 6. And when the woman saw that the tree was good, suitable, pleasant for food, and that it was delightful to look at, and a tree to be desired in order to make one wise, she took of its fruit and ate, and she gave some to her husband, and he ate. Like a good husband and a good Yes, indeed, family. just like me. <laughs> Whatever my wife puts in front of me, I eat. <laughs> no questions asked. <laughs> so, since becoming Christians, yes. we have found that our identity, right, is in the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, Elohim. With them making us also triune. We are also triune. They are triune and we are also triune. Body, soul and spirit. Now I want to ask you a, a question before I go any further. How many of you here have got a sense of humor? I do. Mm -hmm. God gave us all a sense of humor. Why did God give us a sense of humor? Why not? Because he made us in his likeness in nature. So if he if he's if we have a belly laugh, then he where do we get it from? Him. From God. Yeah. And this is what we're going to see. With that with the distortion of their nature through the, the enemy, presented by the serpent, that ours will also, through the works of the enemy, be distorted. Our nature that our nature will also be distorted, which affects directly upon our perception of our new creation. See, so we've got so much old wood and, you know, chaff to get rid of to appreciate what the new creation is. Because if you want to know what the new creation is, look at Jesus. He is the firstborn among many. Do you resemble him? Do you look like him? Do you act like him? Do you speak like him? Do you think like him? Amen? So our perception of the new creation is affected and distorted by the, by the effects of our nature coming from our earthly father. Yes, now, yes, yes. 
So Acts 17, if you would, 17, we're going to look at verses 28 through 30. Amplified the, or? Um, this will be, um, not the Amplified, this will be the Passion. Acts which? Acts 17, Just 28 through 30. Yeah, I only use the Passion, the, the, sorry, the Amplified for the Old Testament now. Unless, of course, I see a verse yeah. that speaks better out of the Amplified in the New Testament. Yeah, 28 through 30? Yeah, we're going to see 28 through 30 of chapter 17. <laughs> of course, uh, Paul here is talking to the Greeks, right? And he says, it is through him that we live and function and have our identity. Just as your own poets have said, our lineage comes from him. Since our lineage can be traced back to God, how could we even think that the divine image could be compared to something made of gold or silver or stone, sculpted by man's work, artwork, and clever imagination. In the past, God tolerated our ignorance of these things, but now the time of deception has passed away. He commands us to repent and turn to God. See that? So where do we get our identity from? As new creations in Christ, where do we get our identity from? From Christ. From God, right? through Christ from God yes. quick question for you what does the word repent mean repent, turn, change. turn and change all right to think differently to think differently and reconsider so the Apostle Paul here is giving us a two-pointed revelation. Firstly, we came from them. Why do I say them? Elohim, yes. The Godhead. So our nature wouldn't be something that was devised by us. Number two, since then we are the offspring of the Godhead, we came from them. If we're the offspring, we came from them. So can you see here that for the moment, for, for the moment, I've begun to use, for the moment, I've begun to use the term the Godhead. This is because it is important. It is important if we are to have a true and accurate perception of God, we must begin to see the Trinity representing the whole, not the hole in the floor, the Godhead. I hope that if you haven't already that you're able to see this because for us to accurately know God, we must know him henceforth as Elohim, the Trinitarian Godhead. Now this may seem a little confusing at first, but it is important that when we say God, right, that, we, that this word includes both the Son and the Holy Spirit, because they are one. To prove that point, let's go to John 1.1 1, 1, in the Passion. Oh, I got mine here, sweet. That's okay. Okay. John 1.1. 1, 1. It says, uh, here we are again. In the beginning, or a beginning, the living expression was already there. And the living expression 
was with God, yet fully God. They were together, face to face, in the beginning. And through his creative inspiration, his living expression, made all things, for nothing has existence apart from him. Fountain of life was in him, for his life is the light of all humanity. See that? So we, 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 what we're doing here, hopefully, is we're beginning to see and build an image, a true image, of God. Godhead, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Because we see here that they were there together in the beginning. They were face to face. Now, I want you, if you can, please, to turn to 2 Corinthians chapter 3 and verse 18. 2 Corinthians chapter 3 and verse 18. Now, understanding then that we come from him, that we are his offspring, we are his children, then 2 Corinthians 3.18 speaks to us. Clearly. So 2 Corinthians 3.18 says, We can all draw close to him with the veil removed from our faces. That veil was the veil of ignorance. And deception mm. brought about by the tree of the knowledge of good and evil blessing and calamity mm. so we can all draw close to him with the veil removed from our faces and with no veil listen to this we all become like mirrors, mirrors. who brightly reflect the glory of the Lord Jesus Christ or the Lord Jesus <laughs> we are being transfigured into his very image as we move from one brighter level of glory to another, and this glorious transfiguration comes from the Lord, who is the Spirit. So they're one. So again, Paul is giving us a two-pointed revelation. Here, first of all, we saw in chapters Isaiah 40 and 46, hopefully, we can see that we came from him, Elohim. So as we can see from Romans 9.21, that his nature couldn't be shaped by us since we are his off offspring, or since we are the offspring of God. So it follows that we came from him, Elohim. Are we all on the same page? So we ought not to think of the divine nature as something that shaped, uh, that is something that is shaped and forged in silver and gold by an, by art, by the art of man, or by man's devices. This then is the first point that Paul is making: that we came from Him, Elohim, and Elohim's nature then couldn't be something of our own devising. As we've already pointed out from Romans 9.21, will the thing form say to him who formed it, what are you doing? <laughs> we have here then a very powerful illustration by the Lord who is telling us you do not define me, I define you. Remember Romans 9.21 is about the lump of clay? Yeah, that's yeah right okay. Here. Now the second point that Paul is making and saying is this, that as his offspring, our nature is defined by Elohim's nature and not the other way around. And because this is a very important point, we can say it this way for clarity. We cannot truly know ourselves apart from knowing Him. 
and try to influence and suck us in. Yes. So listen to this. Man cannot truly know himself because our nature is rooted in his nature. We're his offspring. Amen? Mm -hmm. And that's what we've got to find out and work towards. His nature. So turn with me now, if you will. We've got to go to 2 Peter chapter 1 and verse 4. Yes, Second Peter, chapter 1 and verse 4. Now, as a result of the fact that our nature is rooted in His nature, our likeness is rooted in His likeness. Then when we pick up first, Second Peter 1, 4, it says, As a result of this, he has given you magnificent promises that are beyond all price, so that through the power of these tremendous promises, you can experience what? Partnership with the divine nature, by which you have escaped the corrupt desires that are in the world or of the world. See that? So what then, if anything, body of Christ, what is this telling us? Firstly, it's telling us that we are to be partakers of the divine nature. And that we're created to be partakers of the divine nature. So it has to become clear to us that that's the nature that we've, we have partaken of. When we became born again, that is the nature that we have partaken of. So we can't truly know ourselves apart from knowing Him. You know, the mistake that we make is that we, we try to live in the world and with the world and we're not supposed to be of it. But we're trying to fit in. fit in. And we can't fit in, or if we want to fit in, we can't have his nature. We'll have the world's. Yes. Can you see that? Again, there's your defining. Yes. Get used to being different, different. Yes. Not That's the right. Same different. Not the same, different. Different, different. different, different. Yeah, he yeah. says we are peculiar people. Yes, peculiar. <laughs> yes, we are. <laughs> So if anybody says, who are you? I'm peculiar. I'm peculiar. <laughs> you might as well admit it right there. <laughs> admit it right from the get-go. But did you know where I stand? Yes. <laughs> Put your mind at ease. That's I am right. peculiar. That's right. <laughs> so any, anything then that man applies to the nature of God yeah. will reflect immediately back upon us. Think about that. Yeah, anything, you see, we, we're so influenced by the world and we're not supposed to be. So anything then that we apply to the nature of God, which is foreign, will then be reflected immediately back upon us. So instead of our being part of God's nature, we attempt to defile Him by doing that. Mm -hmm. Can you see that? Mm -hmm. By applying our own nature to Him. Without only seeing him through our own defiled and corrupt standards. Where's that verse that says we're a peculiar people? Well, if, you, if you've got your, you know, your phone or. Yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Um, I, it's, is it not in Hebrews or something? We are a peculiar people. I should bring my little wife on them so I can do that. We are a peculiar people. Yes. 
So, I'm, yeah, I'm sure as many as you have discovered, it wasn't until you actually were filled with the Holy Spirit that you could truly begin to see God more clearly. Until that time, we were trying to make God, listen, in our own image and likeness. Now, humility, unobtrusive humility, is the key to discovering who God truly is. We are told, are we not, to die to ourselves daily in Luke 9.23. And in John 3.30, we're told to, that we're told that, and John the Baptist said this, we are to decrease and he must increase in our lives. Does that happen today? Does that ha it happen every day in our lives? No. We can see that in 2 Peter 1.4, that it tells us, as we've just read, as a result of this, he has given you magnificent promises that are beyond all price. And these tremendous promises, we can ex through these tremendous promises, we can experience partnership with the divine nature by which you have escaped the corrupt desires that are in and of the world. This is also that we, body of Christ, can reveal his image. We are to reveal his image and his likeness and his dominion to the world. Yes. So that in that understanding, we will be able to discover our own image and our own likeness and our own dominion. And this is the revelation of the New Testament. And we'll get deeper into this as we proceed but first, first of all, we're going to find out who God is. It's also important that we have an accurate reading of Scripture. Absolutely. This is very important. For an accurate understanding of Scripture is impossible without an understanding of the true nature of God. You can't read Scripture with any degree of accuracy or any degree of revelation and understanding without it. And by now I hope that we can see this, that you can only read scriptures through our own, listen, lens level of understanding. And our lens level of understanding is always changing with every revelation of God that you receive. That's why we cannot allow ourselves to become stagnant. We must keep forever growing in our own understanding of just who Father is within our own ever-increasing understanding of Him. Can you see this? Mm -hmm. I like the way Joanne used to say it, that God was forever pregnant. Yes, God is forever pregnant. Yes, with the Word. And yes. so must we, if we're going to be like Him and That's right. be, be defined like with Him, yes. then we should always be pregnant with the Word. And get the word in, get the word out, be always be pregnant with the word. Yes. Right? Yes. So it's becoming more and more important that we understand this. Why? Because if you have a particular understanding of who God is, and it just so happens that it is contrary to the truth, then the only doctrine that you'll be able to produce with understanding that you're going to have will be weighed against that. It is impossible to have an accurate understanding and reading of Scripture apart from an accurate understanding and knowledge of God. Therefore, without an accurate understanding of God, your knowledge of God will be corrupt in, a, in accordance with the truth. And truth is what we're seeking. As a consequence of this, your spiritual hearing is going to be distorted. So it's very important, very important that we understand, become more important, more and more 
in an ever-increasing understanding of God. So it's important to have an accurate understanding and reading of Scripture apart from an accurate understanding of the knowledge of God. Therefore, without an accurate understanding of God, your knowledge of God will be corrupt in accordance with the truth. And the truth is what we are seeking. So as a consequence of this, your spiritual healing will be hearing will be distorted with your understanding and your understanding will be proportionately corrupt to the degree then that we misunderstand the nature of God it follows that we are going to misinterpret it, misunderstand scripture and mis and the misunderstanding and communications that we are that we receive from the holy spirit as in John 12:29 so what did we just say? Yeah, that's yeah, what did we just say? What we said was, and we've been saying this from day one, you have to know who you are, whose you are, and what you are in Christ. So as we just said a little bit earlier, you cannot, your, you cannot allow your understanding of the nature of God to be influenced by the world. Because the moment you allow the world's influence to come in, as you're beginning to study the nature of God, it will become corrupt, just like Adam and Eve were. Sounded like it's seven Peter, uh, second Peter one four is talking about that. Yes, yes, yes. So we have the same choices yeah. that the Adams had in the garden. Do we go to the tree of the knowledge of good and evil? Or do we go to the tree of life? Now in John 12, 29, we read, The audible voice of God startled the crowd standing nearby. Some thought it was only thunder, yet others said an angel just spoke to him. This was Father God speaking to Jesus. So, to the degree then that we misinterpret the nature of God, then proportionately we're going to misunderstand Scripture as well. Shall I say that again? What we just read there in John 12, 29 was God talking to Jesus. Yeah. Some thought it was thunder, others thought it was an angel. But this was Father God speaking to Jesus. Now, to the degree then that we misinterpret the nature of God, then proportionately we are going to misunderstand Scripture as well. And we've seen this through the ages. Without, without the leading of the Holy Spirit what does man do with with scripture he makes it the law he binds people or they bind people with it so the way that we misunderstand scripture or the way that we mis misinterpret the nature of God it will reflect itself proportionately in misunderstanding scripture as well we understand that man wraps his doctrine whether it be theistic or atheistic, man wraps their doctrine around their revelation of God. It doesn't make any difference in belief or practice of any kind. It comes down to their individual belief in God. We find then that all of man's teachings, which is what he places his belief systems upon that this is where his information comes from they're all wrapped around his belief in God this is the way that the father wanted it to be the only problem with that is that when false images of God are projected 
onto your heart screen, then the doctrine of Christianity becomes impotent to the believer and disgusting to the world. Why then does the world look at the church with such disdain, distrust, and contempt? Because the image of God that we have projected onto our heart screen have informed us of how we are to think about the world around us. The way that we think that God thinks about, thinks about us and just how he thinks about the world became reflected in our doctrine. See, it is very, very easy and has been for centuries because we're in the world but we're not of it but we don't live that way we live in the world and we live of it and we're not supposed to do that there is supposed to be a difference between a believer and someone of the world it's all right for you. yes agree with the nature and character of God and that the, yes the church has not shown it isn't that what the world sees though is what is what over the centuries the church has done and what the, over the centuries and even up to today what the church is doing if you can use the term heart screen like the screen we just read those songs on yeah right we were, we were projecting the songs onto a screen and what we understand of God we project onto our heart screen and out of the abundance of the heart the mouth, speaks. the mouth speaks so that is what we've presented to the world we haven't presented to the world the truth we have presented a corrupted gospel to the world not only that we're, we're, we've presented our character our character yes mm, not, God's character. not God's character to the world yes right and that's why the world doesn't like the church, because it's exactly. not God's character. Because they'll start thinking of, look what the church has done. Yeah, Look absolutely. what the big thing is going on right now, still with the yep. Catholic Church. Well, and there's, there's two reasons. Can I ask you to speak up, because it's very there, quiet. There's two reasons that people can dislike the church. If you're a truth seeker, you can see the hypocrisy and this thing we're talking about, that the character of God is not being projected, and so that's confusing, and, and that's a stumbling. Yeah. And then you can also dislike the church because, in fact, you don't want the truth of God to be true. That's right. Because when you're still your own God, you have no interest. You know, that's right. Any that's right. That's right. That's true. So... You know, this is where the Holy Spirit has to be Lord <laughs> involved in everything. Yes, That's right. I mean, yeah. you made the statement: if we if we misunderstand the nature of God, we misunderstand Scripture. We misunderstand this, that, whatever. Yes. In reality. Yes. Really, fundamentally. Yeah. If we misunderstand the nature of God, we misunderstand. Everything. Everything. Yes, yes, exactly right. right. Yes. Well, and yes, that's yes, why right. we are seeking and yeah. searching for the nature of God. Yeah. It's going to get good. Oh, I can only yes, tell you it's oh, going to get yeah. good. I, I think it's phenomenal. I was just bringing up some of the things. Yes. Yes. No. Well, I, I'm just about to say that right now. No, no it's okay. <laughs> if you look and think about the church and religion in general, when you scrutinize the way the church has treated the world over the past few centuries, mm. it's quite sad. Mm. 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 What do we mean by our having an introductory process? This is what we're doing. We are establishing an introductory process when we say, by the character and nature of God. So let's define the word nature. You need to write this down. Now, let me ask you this. 
if this applies to you and I, who are made in God's image and likeness, then it applies to God. If we have a sense of humor, it's because God has a sense of humor. Right? If we love, it's because God loves. He put all of those things in us when he made us in his likeness and in his, in his image. So, so, nature. The word nature is defined as the essential qualities or attributes that constitute who one is or who you are. Yes, great. The essential qualities or attributes, attributes. Or attributes. That's it. that constitute who one is or who you are. So in this case, we're talking about who he, God, is. Yes. Now the word nature, the word nature means the essential qualities or attributes that constitute who a person is. Example, their temperament, their affection, their passion, and their appetite. That's the word nature. Now the word essential means that which is necessary to existence and to be. So listen very carefully. Apart from these qualities, in any variation, you'll find that the Father cannot exist as God. It'll come together. Just bear with me. Let me say that again. That the essential qualities and attributes that constitute who God is, yes. and that which is necessary to his existence and being, yes. that apart from these qualities, he cannot exist as God. In other words, his very being, his subject, to his nature. Yes, yes. I hope you can see this. Mm -hmm. So now turn with me in the Old Testament to Malachi 3 6. Malachi 3 6. That's the book we read often, isn't it? Oh, all the time. <laughs> That's at the end, one of the 12 minor prophets, right? Correct. Yeah. And to close this session on a high note, we'll take a look at this verse from Malachi. And I'm going to leave you to think about this verse until next time. Okay, what is it? Malachi, Malachi 3 6. Okay, 3 6. Now we just said, did we not? That his very being is subject to his nature. Yes, yes, yes. And it's necessary to his existence and being. And apart from these qualities, he cannot exist as God. But we see here, he's talking to the Israelites and he's saying, For I am the Lord, I do not change. That is why you, O sons of Jacob, are not consumed. So, if we can read between the lines here for a minute, to extract the necessary inference here, the Lord is saying, if I were to change, I would cease to exist as God. Yeah. And you would exist, cease to exist, and everything would cease to exist. But he said, I am the Lord, I do not change. So we start from that, I do not change. I am the Lord, I do not change. That is why you sons of Jacob are not consumed. So I want you to take that home and read it and study it 
and see what you come up with. Pull it apart. Pull it apart. That you should pull apart. Yeah. And of course, that's what we just read between the lines oh, to extract the necessary God, inference here that the Lord is saying, if I were to change, I would cease to exist. Yeah, yeah, yes. As God. That's yeah, powerful, yeah, isn't it? Yeah, oh yeah. So while that's tumbling around in your head and your spirit, <laughs> I'll say now, may the Lord God bless you and keep you. May the Lord lift up his countenance upon you and cause his face to shine upon you and give you his peace. Amen. So until the next time, shalom, God bless you, and goodbye. Amen.